video is to learn with your experience for many, many, many years as someone who believes in sharing economy, uh, believes in collaboration and alternative and complementary currencies. But more than believing, you do things about believing. You've been writing, creating time bank, um, so many things that we just want to explore here. Before you tell about yourself, um, tell me a little bit of how money shaped your life. All right. Well, it's interesting because my father was a child of the Depression. And so he was extraordinarily frugal in ways that went beyond what you would imagine frugality being. And so growing up, my relationship with money was one of complete scarcity. Oh, wow. <laughs> yes. Like, we weren't allowed even to go buy clothes in a store. My mother made our clothes, mm -hmm. you know, and a lot of things that my parents thought were extravagant were things that people today think are normal, you know. So I would say I grew up with a scarcity mindset, and I haven't shed it completely yet. And I've always had a bit of an antagonistic relationship with money as a result. You know, I've never liked it. I've never liked and talking about it or dealing with it particularly. But I do remember always this inner wish to never have to worry about it. Mm -hmm. I, I didn't want to be rich, didn't care about being rich, am not rich, but I didn't want to have to worry about money because some of the more painful moments in my life were times when mm -hmm. I had to worry about it or it was short when I needed it or, mm -hmm. you know, like everybody, I think it was, Pain is associated with money. Yes. What led you to like rethink money or see hope into money? Because I think a lot of your work through life is just showing a different type of money to people and and really making it about us and about a common good. So tell me a little bit of, of from this beginning relationship of life with scarcity, which actions you took to like see it in a different way or to act on it? From a lot of my working life and, and my um, spiritual life as well has been committed to environmental issues. And so I, from a very young age, I was interested in protecting the environment and renewable energy and biodiversity conservation and all, all sorts of environmental issues. And I worked through about 20 years of that before I really came to the realization that developing sustainable communities was going to be more effective than protesting or working only on environment, because the environment is the end of the pipe. It's the result of all the other things upstream from what's going on in the environment, including the economy, that cause environmental problems. And it was when I finally was organizing a big conference in Vermont mm -hmm. about sustainable communities, and I invited the speaker named Bernard Leotard mm -hmm. to come. And he had been a central banker in Europe. He had helped invent the Euro, and he'd written a lot mm -hmm. about monetary systems. So he's, he's a very knowledgeable man about that. And he stood up in front of the audience that I gathered for this conference and said, well, Gwen hasn't given me enough time to tell you why the monetary system completely undermines sustainable communities. But I will tell you a few things. And he gave a very good talk, and I was left going, what? the monetary system uh -huh. does that, really? Uh -huh. <laughs> so I had a chance to talk to him later, and, and it developed this long collaboration that we had, where we worked together to write several books. Um, one was called Community Currency, and that book has been translated into 13 languages and used all over the world. Another one was called Creating Wealth, Growing Local Economies with Local Currencies. And the third was Local Action for Sustainable Economic Renewal. And what we did with these books was we showed how community leaders could actually use monetary innovation to achieve their sustainability goals. And do you have any favorite or good example of these cases of communities that you share in the book? Can you share one or two that you really think like this community was able to like just through collaboration and thinking in a new innovative way, 
Well, I think my favorite stories are really about time banks. Okay, cool. Because time banks, I know it may I'm not glad to hear yes, that. I know. <laughs> <laughs> but no, time I, banks no. are fairly easy uh -huh. when it comes to how you implement them, especially in our culture and our context. So it's an easy way for people to start experiencing what life can be like if you're not tied in with our existing monetary system. Why do we have poverty? We're one of the wealthiest populations in history. We shouldn't have poverty anymore. And it's absolutely possible to eradicate it. Yes. But the current monetary system imposes it on us. Mm -hmm. It causes it. It's not an accident yes. that we have a very small percentage of people that control most of the world's financial resources. That's what the monetary system that we have now is built to do. We don't know what money is. And that is the problem because money has a particular structure. It's a system that works. And from my experience now, having met lots of people who work within the banking, insurance, finance system, they also don't understand it. It was created over a hundred years ago. Those people are all dead. And, and they built this system that is based on the issuance of debt as the way we create money. We are a resourceful human family. Mm -hmm. We should be able to feed, clothe, care for all of our members mm -hmm. without this money being a problem. Mm -hmm. You know, and we, we don't. Mm -hmm. And it's getting worse. Yes. So it's very important that people start understanding that the kind of money we're using is really the root of the problem. It doesn't need to go away completely. There certainly are things that a debt-based system can support, but we need a lot of other kinds of money to counteract mm -hmm. the negative effects that it has. Yes, and you even wrote a book about community currencies. So how do you see the community currencies play a role? Because time is one of the currencies that communities can use, but there's a lot of local community-based currencies that they create just to make people thrive in the local economy. What, what are the the community currencies and how they play a role in this new transformative economy? Well, I've designed a food currency in Vermont. Mm -hmm. So figuring out a way to make sure that the people who grow and process and prepare food are paid better mm -hmm. and that the food economy is stronger was the purpose of that one. It isn't completely implemented yet, uh -huh. but it has been talked about and discussed and if we ever hit a place where we're in a similar kind of economic crash, I'm sure it won't be hard to get going. I would love to hear how it is to also live in an eco village right. and live collaboration through like sharing a community and and what you did in Vermont is it's great, but how it comes to the local level of family or like five families living together, how do you see like an eco village and these kind of permaculture uh, societies and, and culture uh, playing a role into awakening people to collaborative economy and everything. Well, I live in an eco-village called the Headwaters Garden and Learning Center, which I founded back in 2009. And what we have done there, which is an economic model that's different than the average mm -hmm. home or, or small neighborhood, is we've used a community land trust model as our as our property ownership model and what that does is it imposes a limited equity arrangement on all the property in the eco village mm -hmm. so in order to live there you build a house and in the normal market living in a beautiful place with a nice little house with neighbors that you love the value, the speculative value of that real estate would go way up. Mm -hmm. And that has been the case with a lot of intentional communities around the country. They're very nice places to live. And before you know it, the only people that can afford to live there because of its market value that it's escalating are the rich. Mm -hmm. So they become gated communities for the 1%. They're not really real okay. communities. Mm -hmm. But at Headwaters, because you can't sell your house mm -hmm. for that speculative value, we limit the amount that the house will ever be worth. Okay. And there's a formula built right into the deed that allows the value to escalate with the rate of inflation. So you can get your money back 
but you're not going to get the speculative value back. And the community has the first right of refusal on your property. So basically what that formula does, mm -hmm. if you decide to sell your house and leave, and by the way, nobody's done that yet because it's a yes, nice place to live, but you know, <laughs> if you decide to sell <laughs> your house and leave, then the community would be able to buy it back from you, and that gives us our price. Yes. A yes, fair yes. price. Mm -hmm. It's a wonderful place. I exactly. love it. We have, you can't build a house that's bigger than 1,800 square feet, mm -hmm. which is, you know, it's a house big enough for a small yes. family. It's not a teeny house, but it's modest size. You're not going to build a star castle. Yes. Exactly. <laughs> you know? But the idea is also to enjoy the land. Yeah. And, yeah. And I think this is another question, like how the relationship with living near nature teach you about uh, the whole restorative economy and these like new ways of doing business and agreements. Do you learn anything with the land? All the time. All the time. You know, we have we model our practices on permaculture. We have this big garden and an earthship greenhouse and chickens and ducks and trout in our pond. You know, I mean, it's mm -hmm. and um, the cooperative agreements that we have with each other and the way the community works i just it's another world mm -hmm. it is another world to live in a community where people are living as a community than it is to live individually in a house mm -hmm. all by yourself somewhere mm -hmm. because like we share a lot of costs we you know we have one tractor that we actually share with a couple of our neighbors mm -hmm. we have one lawnmower that you know mows everybody's grass we have limited amounts of money we have to spend on certain equipment because we all share it. So know? that's part of the abundance. When I think you're very inspiring also because of your values and what you believe. And the name of like my company and, and the social impact yeah. business is Believe. So I I love asking her and like what do you believe in terms of um, where we are heading to and so what do you believe for the future and also which beliefs brought you here, which beliefs that made you feel hopeful enough to create and, and dream with a new economy and something good out of this scarcity and like um, trouble. So what do you believe? Well, that's a great question because I've spent a lot of time thinking about that and, and also experiencing it. So what I'm maybe going to say is, might seem a little bit distant, but I've had personal experience that tells me this is the truth. And I think what we've been experiencing up until now over the last couple thousand years, maybe even more, is a very patriarchal system mm -hmm. that has systemically degraded and suppressed what we might think of as the divine feminine in all of us, the great mother. And we're in an era where that's coming back. So what we're seeing with that shift is right now, sadly, all of the dimensions of patriarchy being very obvious to all of us mm -hmm. in painful ways. Mm -hmm. The Me Too movement, this presidency, you know, all of the violence that is happening around the world. But that's making room for a resurgence of feminine values and, and divine feminine values. It's not really a matter of men and women. No. It's a matter of differences between competition and cooperation, mm -hmm. between collaboration and, mm -hmm. you know, violence. And so it's, I see that hope springing up everywhere. Time banks is a very feminine currency mm -hmm. in a way. It, yes. It's it's cooperative. It's egalitarian. We all only have 24 hours in a day. It's the great equalizer in some ways. Time. So I'm really seeing, even though what we're going through right now is horrible and painful in a lot of ways, it's opening the door for a new day. Mm -hmm. And I I wake up every morning with that hope in my heart. Thank you.